Hello, everybody. Not quite the crowd we had last night, but hopefully everything works tonight and we can get through our lesson. I hope you all had a good good day. Man, is it cold. Not a good thing. Well, let's pray and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for this day. Thank you, Father, for your blessings on us, for your grace, for your mercy. Thank you, Father, for giving us life and life more abundant. We ask you, Lord God, continue to protect because we know your word does it for us, protects us from every plague, every sickness, every disease, everything that creeps on the ground. Father, we are protected from it all because your shield is about us. You have put a hedge around us, Lord God, protected us. The blood of Jesus has covered us and made us whole and healed in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. And We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, for being here. Um, I will um, send out a text real quick to a few people. I, I thought we would see a lot more people jumping on, and, and I'm sure people thought, oh, this is Thursday. Uh, forget about it, you know? Um, but if you give me just a second, I will um, remind a couple people that they're they should be on with us and uh and we'll we will have a good time uh we're going to be talking about joe and the boys tonight now we started talking about that um a little bit last night before i was cut off and believe me i i have no idea why that was um it it just would not come back and i checked with tech support today and they they told me it was my fault. Uh, my internet wasn't fast enough, but Betty was on at the same time that I was in the other computer and, and using the same internet source. So we don't know. Let's let's get with it here. Um, Joe and the boys, kind of an interesting thing. Um, oh, Barb's computer's not working now. Oh, there she is. She's she is on. Well, thank you, Miss Barb. Wait a minute here. I hope you all are experiencing economic stimulus checks, blessings from heaven, uh, no coronavirus, no anything, um, as, as the Lord blesses us. Joe, of course, Joseph, he was um, all computer problem. Okay, Barb, we got you, though. You're here. Um, Barb was Barb. Joseph was in Egypt, as you know. He was captured. He was taken there. And part of the whole thing with him is he spent a lot of time being very, very patient. As you know, he got put, put in the prison. He waited a long time for all the people that said that they would remember him. Um, and as they, you know, as they didn't remember him, he didn't lose his patience. He didn't lose who he was. He kept continuing on. I, I think in Christianity, that's one thing that all of us have to be. We, we have to be not just resilient, but flexible for the things that happen in life, because we can we can blame the devil. And there's a lot of that that goes on that people blame the devil for stuff that's actually stuff they did. And uh, we can we can blame God if we want. A lot of people blame God for everything. And it, it's just not a um, it's not the way we're supposed to live our life. If we look at the people in the Old Testament, a lot of them, like Joseph, that went through things, they had a tremendous amount of patience. Abraham had a tremendous amount of patience. He left Ur of the Chaldees. It was years and years and years and decades before he actually ends up getting to the promised land, inheriting the promise of the land that God had given him. So one thing that works through all of God's people is this patience thing. Now, Joseph, after he gets let out of prison, uh, because he was able to interpret Pharaoh's dream accurately. He rises to great power in Egypt, and he's appointed as the head of the seven-year effort to save the country from the impending famine. Now, they had seven years of, I mean, incredible harvest, and he predicted that right, or he, he spoke that right, according to the dream that he interpreted as the Lord gave him the interpretation. and then. 
he's put in charge now, though, after making a recommendation of himself, really. And, and I, I don't think he, he went and said, hey, there's only one guy. Let me describe me. I think he just went and told the king or the pharaoh exactly who should be running the thing, not him, but just the type of person that needed to do it. And then Pharaoh looked around and said, well, there isn't anybody else. I think that's the way it should work in every believer's life. We should be so excellent at everything we do, but not not big-headed, braggadocious, and taking over the world about it, telling everybody. If we have to tell everybody how great we are, uh, we're probably not that great. And so Joseph is just kind of cool, patient, cool, calm, collected, tells Pharaoh, hey, this is what's got to happen. This is what you're going to need to do. Pharaoh looks around. Jeez, there isn't anybody else. Looks like it's you. So he built some giant storage facilities for the grain that they saved during the first seven years. There are some uh, archaeologists who believe that that was the purpose of the of the pyramids in Egypt, is that their original purpose, because of the way that they were constructed, stuff doesn't rot in them, including human bodies. And so because of the way that they constructed them, they could store a lot of grain in them. Now, there are some people who say, well, the chambers inside really aren't that big. But there was things done after Joseph that would have, um, would have made the chambers not as big as they were. They were actually subdivided off on the inside. But many believe that that's when, the, uh, when these great big silos, basically, were constructed, was during that time. And Joseph had a tremendous amount of wisdom way beyond anything we can think of today. I mean, he didn't have uh, slide rules and calculators and computers and uh, digital graphic stuff to be able to draw out a building or, or to be able to figure all this stuff out. He was all on his own with just wisdom. Now, um, word had gotten around that Egypt had plenty of grain and more than anybody else in the in the whole world, because nobody had anything. There was a worldwide famine. Israel hears of this plenty that's happening in Egypt, and he sends his son, or, or his 10 sons. He leaves Benjamin at home. He keeps Benjamin. Um, sound? Yeah, they, they did use clay urns, Ed, but they, they actually had silos built. And, and nobody's quite sure because they, they haven't been able to find anything other than the pyramids dating back to that era. So it, it's um, kind of an inter interesting thing the way that they did it. So he keeps Benjamin, who is Joseph's natural born brother, at home with him. Now, understand, Benjamin is a special kid. Benjamin was born, and, and I'll go into a little bit of this in just a minute, but Benjamin is born to the same mother as Joseph. The only two kids that she had was Rachel. That was the one that uh, Joseph really loved. He, he wasn't head over heels in love with Leah. And despite what we think that she was kind of a homely girl or something, the, the word comely in the scriptures does not mean homely. It, it means that um, it, it act, actually means attractive, but it wasn't the one he loved. He loved Rachel. And he was willing to work a long time for Rachel, but then Rachel was barren. She couldn't have kids. Then she cried out to the Lord. The Lord heard her. Of course, she was also the one that hid the, the gods, her father's gods under her, uh, under her bottom. Said he, and then lied about her customary time so that he wouldn't um, so so that he wouldn't look or he wouldn't ask her to get up. And Joseph recognized his brothers and blesses them, but they're in fear. Joseph plays them until they return with his full brother, that's Benjamin. In seeing they followed his request in order to purchase more grain, he prepares a table for them. As they go to sit, Joseph sees Benjamin. He can't control his emotions and runs off to a private chamber to weep. We find this in Genesis 43, 29 through 30. It says, Then he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your younger brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, Be gracious to you, my son, or God be gracious to you, my son. 
Now his heart yearned for his brother, so Joseph made haste and sought somewhere to weep. And he went into his chamber and wept there. Now, in this scenario, Joseph, Joseph is a type of Christ in that he is not recognized by his brothers. Jesus wasn't recognized by his brothers. I mean, the, the Hebrew people did not recognize him as Messiah. In this case, Joseph is kind of the, the leader. Uh, he's only uh, one down from Pharaoh, and, and his brothers don't recognize him. He is also the last born of Jacob's sons before God changed his name to Israel. Now, we, we see this, um, this, when Rachel has uh, her firstborn, which is Joseph, then they're on their way back. She's pregnant again. They're on their way back to Esau, and Joseph had, or Jacob has this encounter with the Lord, and the Lord changes his name then. He says, you're not going to be Jacob anymore, the deceiver, the supplanter, but now you're going to be Israel which is um, the, the one who, who controls God or the one who has power with God. Now, the, Jesus is the last of the prophets and deliverer born to the nation of Israel before salvation comes. So both of them are the last born before a significant event in Israel's history. Benjamin, however, is the last child born to Israel but the first after his name's changed. I'll tell you why that's significant. Um, there is a Benjamin generation coming. If you look at the disciples, I mean, if you look at the, um, the, the line, the 12 uh, sons of Jacob, if you, if you look at them and the prophecy in Genesis 50 about them, each one was given a prophecy about their life. Each one was called out in, in a certain character. If you look at those, those can also, and, and they map out this way, they map out as the different waves of, um, of belief within Israel that have come to pass. The last one being Benjamin. Now you say, well, well what's so important about that? I'm glad you ask. Um, the other 11 represent the generations of the Hebrew people but Benjamin represents generations after Jacob's conversion. So the 11 generations of Israel are blessed by the favor of God, but the last generation, the generation, the Benjamin generation, is blessed fivefold. This generation is the church of today. It, it is, it's us. We are the last of, of Israel, so to speak. It is the body of Christ. Now, we don't replace Israel as a people, but we are grafted in and thereby becoming the, the uh, Benjamin generation. We are blessed fivefold as Benjamin was blessed five times his brother. Now, let me, let me show you this. Genesis 43, verse 31. Then he washed his face and came out, and he restrained himself, and he said, Serve the bread. Now, Joseph, another place where he is a type of Christ. He serves his brother's bread. If you ever notice, bread and wine are always covenant issues. They are always covenant issues. You want to know why we want to want you to take communion every day and why we want to do it when we when we're at church because it speaks of covenant. It speaks the bread speaks of health, well-being, and the wine speaks of covenant. Joseph serves his brothers bread and wine as Jesus served his disciples bread and wine and making a covenant of blessing with them. Joseph is doing the same thing with his brothers here. They don't, and, and just like his Jesus' disciples, Joseph's brothers don't recognize it. And I'll show you that when we get to the end of this lesson. They're still fearful. Genesis 43, verse 34. Then he took servings to them from before him. But Benjamin's serving was five times as much as any of theirs. So they drank and were merry with him. The ben Benjamin generation is going to, or is five times more blessed. And we see a lot of scriptures about that. Why five times? Five is the, the number of grace. It's the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the hay. The hay is revelation or grace. The Benjamin generation is going to have more revelation about who God is than any other generation. Who, who's the Benjamin generation? The body of Christ. We're, we're in, the, yeah, and there are fivefold gifts, exactly right. And so we're, we're in 
that Benjamin generation. Now, this is, um, I just kind of ran down a short list of the ways that Joseph is a type of Christ. And, and it's incredible as he goes through. And the reason why we want to point this out, it's Joseph did a great thing in that he was patient. He went, he, um, he um, connected with Pharaoh. He redeemed the nation of Israel. They, they would have been destroyed like most of the other people or had losses of a lot of his brothers, perhaps, and family because of the, the enormous famine that was going across the nation or in the whole world at the time. But more than that, Joseph has a lot of character details of, of Jesus, the patience, the, the, um, the waiting on God, the, the willingness to sacrifice himself, all of those things. And, and then the grace, more than anything, the grace with which he operates. He's got, you, you say, well, well, where's he got grace at? Well, let's start, let's start with his brothers. Um, it doesn't say that he went on and on and on about his brothers. Then talk about the grace that he had with, in Potiphar's house. That's the reason why Potiphar loved him so much. The man, the man just exuded grace. He was a gracious person. Then he gets um, in prison. He is grace for the uh, the baker and the the cupbearer, the king's cupbearer and the king's baker. He is grace for them. And and even after they don't do what they say, he continues with them and having grace for them. And and even when they come back and and. He says, oh, man, I, I forgot all about you. I'm sorry about that. But, you know, uh, the other guy lost his head already. Yeah, OK, well, um, here. It's, it's all right. God meant this to be just like this. It was all for this time. He, he just would wait on God. Now, I'm going to list just the short list. There is about 75, at least 75 ways that Joseph is like Jesus. Both were hated by their brethren without a cause. Both were shepherds. Both were hated for being the truth to light, for bringing the truth to light. Both destined to become kings from birth. Both of these guys from their birth were destined to become kings. Jesus was destined to become a king. Joseph was destined to become a king. Both were stripped of their, of their special robe. Joseph had his coat of many colors. Jesus had his uh, tunic that he had on, his robe that he had on, that uh, didn't have a seam in it, which was amazing in that day. Um, both were sold for the price of a slave. Joseph's coat was sprinkled with blood of a goat, while Jesus' clothing was sprinkled with his own blood, the blood of the scapegoat. Both had fake news stories. I, I couldn't resist that. Both had fake news stories told of their deaths. Both were sentenced with two criminals beside them. In each case, one was lost and one survived. Now, in Jesus' case, Jesus told the one, this day you'll be with me in paradise. And the other one, nah, we don't think he made it because he cursed God. Remember, he cursed God and, and, and said all kinds of blasphemous things. Um, and then he died. In the case of the, the baker and the cupbearer, one survived, one didn't. Jesus was sinless. And there's not one sin recorded regarding Joseph, although both were tempted with sin. Both Jesus and Joseph, both tempted with sin, serious sin. And it's not recorded anywhere that Joseph sinned. He didn't fail. After suffering, both were exalted to a place of homage and placed on a seat of authority and ultimate rule. Both Joseph and Jesus were 30 years old when they began their respective ministries or their respective destinies. Both turned intentional harm and evil into blessing. Intentional harm and evil was, was put upon Joseph. He turned it into blessing. Jesus, obviously, intentional harm was put upon him. What's he do? He goes to the cross, turns the worst of intentional harm into blessing. In all, there's at least 75 things where Joseph is seen to be a type of Christ, but there isn't 
any so powerful as his pouring out grace with extreme patience on his brothers who did not deserve it. His, his whole way that he dealt with his brothers it is, I mean, it, that's just an incredible thing. Take a look at Genesis 45, 5 through 9. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. This this statement for him, when he tells his brothers this, you, you can see God's move in it. And, and if we could get this kind of mind, when, it, when the word talks about us having the mind of Christ, I think it, it's a mind like this, where we look at everything as coming through God. He, the whole time he's coming along. Now, he, he had some, uh, I mean, I'm not sure if I was given a dream that I was going to uh, rule over a whole bunch of people that were older than me in my own family. And, and one day that they would bow down to serve me. I'm, I'm not sure I'd go tell my brothers that and my dad. But Joseph is given that dream and he doesn't know how to temper what he sees. And, and he just runs and tells his brothers. Of course, all of that he finds out later on also fits into the narrative because had he not done that, he would have not been thrown into the into the pit. He would have not been rescued out of the pit, sold to the Midianites, and then uh, later on found himself in Egypt. And he wouldn't have been there to preserve the, the, the nation of Israel alive. Now, would God still have gotten it done? Sure. But we got to look at what happened in our, in our life. And I think that's something that Joseph, I mean, when we think about him, he can look back at this point. He's he's got power. He's got authority. He's, he's got more money. He knows what to do with. He's made the entire nation of Egypt, the, the, actually the Pharaoh of Egypt. He has made him richer than what he could have ever imagined. They own all the lands around because the people tied, deeded over all the land to him, and and um, and then they went back to farming their own land after they were given provision. So he, he has this whole plan, and it works to a T. He's made Pharaoh richer than Pharaoh could have ever imagined. This Pharaoh is actually younger than Joseph. Um, a lot of people believe that this is um, the guy that was the Pharaoh at the time that all this started um, was, was older. And his son is really the, actually the guy here that... Um, Joseph is talking about, he's made me a father to Pharaoh. That that was actually the original Pharaoh's son when Joseph first got there under Potiphar. And and then he but he but he's leading this guy along, right? And if we can think about us as believers, God puts us in positions, God brings us through things, God takes us along a path. We might not like where it's at at the time. We might not like where, um, yeah, Ed sent me a little note and it says he wept over his brothers like Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Yeah, that was on my list of 75, but it didn't make it into my short list. But, but that's a good point. That all shows his heart. He, Joseph is a great study. If you're wanting to know what should I be like as a Christian, Joseph is a great study because he's got faith, he's got patience. He he operates with a lot of grace. All the things that Jesus did, Joseph carried out in his life and put it in action. And one of the things, the biggest takeaways I get with Joseph in looking at his life is he has the ability to look back and say, wow, maybe I didn't handle that part right. Maybe I didn't do this well, but look where I'm at. So that had to have played into me being where I'm at now. I mean, let's face it, we've all made mistakes. 
In some cases, people marry the wrong people. They um, they get the wrong jobs. They move to the wrong places. I mean, people make some really um, life changing decisions that at the time seem good and work out bad. And it's easy enough to say, well, look, I, I was trying to do this and I was a believer then and I was going here and there and, you know, and I got to this place and, you know, God abandoned me. He just dropped me on him on my head. I thought I heard him. Listen, I've been there. There was times I, I said, boy, I know I heard God about this. And I made a decision based upon what I really felt in my heart and what I knew in my heart was right. And it turned out completely bad. And, and it, it's like ending up in prison. Yeah, and you can stay there and you can say in your heart, boy, what did God do to me? Or what's wrong with me? How come I made this this bad decision? Well, I prayed about it. I thought I heard the right things. This is crazy, you know, and you can you can beat yourself up over it, or you can do like Joseph and say, Wow, everything has happened before me up to this point. God's doing something. He's working this out for my good and for his glory. And that's exactly the heart that Joseph had. We see this as he goes along here. Listen, he goes, hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son, Joseph, God has made me Lord over all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. In the end of days, Jesus will say to his brothers, the Hebrew people, those exact same words. My father's given me all of this. Come, come up to me. Come up to me. And look at Romans 11, 26 and 27. And so all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. There was something in the heart of Joseph that was different than the heart of his brothers. For one thing, I think Joseph really got a grasp, and, and I, I believe this with all my heart. It's because of the time frame that he was born in. He was born into a time frame right before Jacob had his name changed from Jacob to Israel. So he would have been a young man when that happened. He got to see all the things that happened with his father, but now his father is an absolute believer. He, he's got his heart delivered over to God. You want to talk about where you ought to be as a parent, where you ought to be as a grandparent, where you ought to be as a testimony of Christ. When, when you influence somebody's life to such a way that their thinking gets embedded with, I know God is God, and I know he's bringing me along this path, and there will be a, an ultimate outcome that will be for his glory. Now, I'm not in a camp by any means. You know, like some people said, well, God's doing this coronavirus thing to America on, for a reason, to teach us a lesson. God doesn't tempt us with evil. He doesn't tempt us with evil. He doesn't, he doesn't put us in situations of evil in order to, to teach us a lesson or to move us along. We actually put ourselves in a lot of places. And that because the world is sinful, because the world is a bad place, because the world still, um, we believers have redemption, and the world ultimately will be redeemed, and it is even crying out now for us to get it figured out. It's what the scriptures say. It says the whole earth moans and groans and travail, waiting for the appearance of the sons of God. It's waiting for us. The earth is waiting for us. And and so when when we start to look at the character of Joseph, we got to start looking at what, how, do, how does this show me who Jesus is? Well, he, he's a great example because it says Jesus endured the cross, open, didn't even open his mouth. Take a look at Genesis 45, 25 through 27. Then they come up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to Jacob, their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still, because he did not believe it. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when they, he saw the carts 
which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, was revived. This is God's MO again. This is God's MO. He's going to woo Israel back to himself with blessings, not punishment or cursing. God blesses in order to win souls. God blesses in order to bring people to him. I, I know people have preached and listened in my early days. I, I had some good hellfire and brimstone messages. And the, um, well, I shouldn't say I had good ones. Let, let's say they were, they were um, persuasive hellfire and brimstone messages. But the, the, the main point of Joseph's life is grace. This is Jesus in action. This is God working through Jesus here to, to bring us to himself. No, notice they brought all this stuff. He doesn't believe what they say, but he sees all the blessing that they bring with them, and Jacob's spirit melts. He melts. And he revives. We've got to see the blessing. Instead of looking for the cursing all the time, instead of looking for the other shoe to drop all the time, we have got to see the blessing. Genesis 46, 3 through 4. So he said, I am God, the father, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt. This is God speaking to Jacob. Don't fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will surely bring you up again. And Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. This, you, you, you got to get this. Joseph sees Jesus in a vision. He identifies himself as the I am. He identifies himself that way. Enoki L, or I who exist am Almighty. That would be the, the uh, literal interpretation of Enoki L, which is the, the phrase there, I am God. I who exist am Almighty. He's telling him, I'm, I'm God Almighty. L is the shortened name, meaning the God of creation and strength. Then God says, He is the Elohim of Jacob's father. So God is strongly reinforcing his promise to Abraham, or of Abraham, being a great nation once again to Jacob. It's God's plan, repetition. God gives us a word, and then he continues to repeat it over and over again. How many of you have ever had that kind of situation in your life where you, you, you kind of scratch your head and you, yeah, you know, okay, I got this promise of God, and you know, eh, maybe it's okay. And then later on, somebody else confirms it to you. Somebody else repeats it to you. Or you find it in a word or you read it in a book. And it's, it's the exact same thing. Has anybody had that testimony where, where God has shown himself and kept repeating something over and over to him? Man, I know I have. Um, and, and it's, it's a... Um, it, it's an experience that we get. God doesn't tell us something and then, okay, well, I told you once, you should have listened. It's God tells us things, but, but then God reinforces what he tells us. It's the reason why he tells us faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Why do we go to church? We go to church because we haven't heard anything. We're, we're going to hear something new. I mean, I know people that they're always itching to hear something new, but that's not, that's not what God does for us. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. God tells us something, tells us his word, whether it's a word of salvation or it's a word for healing, or it's, it's um, some other promise that we get. Or, or maybe it's it's one of those um, one of those rhema words. You know, we got a hold of something. It was a really a rhema word for us, and and we get a hold. We know it's going to change our life, and and so 
we, but then it doesn't happen. It, you know, it just doesn't happen. And, and time goes on, it still doesn't happen. And then something else happens where the same thing comes out to us again. And something else happens and it comes out to you again. I've had that happen a couple times. And, and after the first time it happened, I was like, man, that's, that's pretty coincidental, you know? But then I start listening. God repeats himself with his blessing. That, that's his modus operandi. That's the way he, he works. He, he tells us something, and then he continues to show us and continues to repeat the same thing over and over. Not because he needs to remember. <laughs> we do. When God tells Jacob that Joseph will place his hands on Jacob's eyes, this he's speaking of revelation. Think about that. He, he says, when, when Jacob comes in, Joseph, the older, is going to lay hands on your eyes. God is going to reveal to Jacob unseen things of the plan. It's Joseph, the type of Christ, that's going to give him revelation. Jesus came to bring us revelation of who God is in all of his character. Jesus is the one that puts his hands on our eyes. We wonder why we have laying on the hands in church. Well, you know, people say that, you know, well, will you lay your hands on me and bless me? Well, we might not be able to do that for a little bit, but he says to us, why are we, uh oh, I hope I'm not frozen. I hope you guys can still hear me. There you go. I My picture froze for a second. I thought we were having a repeat of last night. The laying on of the hands, when he says this, he's going to lay hands on your eyes. Think about what happened with Paul the Apostle. Paul went blind. It wasn't that Paul didn't know the scriptures. It wasn't Paul didn't know what the Word of God said back in the Old Testament because Paul was a Hebrew scholar. He even says he was a, he was a, a, a scholar and a rabbi among rabbis. Paul was, listen, Paul was the theological machine of his day. And the, what happens to him when he gets knocked off his high horse is he gets blinded in his eyes. It isn't until um, he's he goes to um, well, was it Simon's house, and and then the the apostle comes and lays hands on his eyes and opens his eyes. Think about this with Jacob. Jacob knows all what God is going to do, but he doesn't understand why this thing is happening. He's lost his favorite son. Joseph was by far his favorite son. He loses him. Now Benjamin and, and all the other brothers have to go off and prove, you know, that they're they're good guys, or or he's and he's in fear that he's going to lose all of them. He's um, he's in the middle of a famine. He's in danger of losing all of his people to this famine. And, he, and now he's got to go into this land that he doesn't want to go into, Egypt, uh, to, to buy grain or to, to prove himself because the, the man in charge there wants him to come there. This old guy's got a lot of things happening in his life that are stressful. And here God's going to lay hands on his eyes and reveal revelation to him. That's what Jesus did for us. Jesus gave us revelation of how God functions how God operates, the things that, the, the character of God. And that's why when we study the Old Testament and we go through and we start looking for Jesus in all these places, we start looking for the character of God. We start looking for how God reveals himself to us and through the eyes of grace, through the eyes of Jesus. Jesus brings us revelation. The Hebrews believe that the eyes are the window of the soul, that with your eyes, that's how revelation comes in. When God tells Jacob that he is going with him into Egypt, it is the same as Jesus telling his disciples that he's going to go with them into all the world, even until the ends of the age. Ed says, can you imagine the terror the brothers had after seeing Joseph, uh, then experiencing his forgiveness? Oh my goodness. Can you, Let's get to that. Genesis 48, 19 through 20. 
But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. Now this is, let me set this up for you. Joseph, or Jacob's at the end of his life. He's, he's at the very end of his days, and he knows it. He knows it's coming. Um, we, we find in many of these Old Testament characters, they, they knew when, when the end was coming. I think a lot of believers know. They just have a sense about when it's going to happen. Uh, I've been around enough people to know that, that they know. And, and um, it's, it's strange, but after they say something to me, um, I go, wow, they're, they're not going to be here very long. I, I just know because I can read it. I can see it in them. Genesis 48, 19 through 20. He's getting ready to lay hands on Joseph's sons. Um, and it's Ephraim and Manasseh. He's getting ready to lay his, his hands on, on them. And he switches. Joseph wants him to lay hands on the, the oldest son first. And he goes to the youngest. Just like happened to his father. He goes to lay his hands on the youngest, I mean, on the oldest, or he, Jacob wants him to lay, or Joseph wants him to lay his hands on the oldest. He's going to lay his hands on the youngest. But his father refused and said, I know my son, I know. He also shall become a people and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. So he blessed them that day, saying, By you Israel will bless, saying, May God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. And thus he set Ephraim before Manasseh. Keeping in God's character, he uses the two sons of Joseph to teach us how he works. He would put, and you got to remember the names of Ephraim and Manasseh. Um, because Ephraim is forgetting, or pardon me, Manasseh is forgetting what is behind. And Ephraim is, his name actually means double portion. Now take a look at this now. This is not an insignificant fact with God. We would put forgetting everything that was behind us. In other words, Man, I got to forget my sins before I'm blessed. I got to forget this before I'm blessed. I got to, you know, I got to forget the path I was on before I'm blessed. I, and people do this. I Listen, I went through a whole course one time um, at, at a church we were at. And the whole course was about how to get rid of all the stuff behind you. It was the whole course. Whole course was about getting rid of everything behind you, all the stuff that had drug out in your life. Now, there were probably some good points to that. And the, the person that was teaching the class, they, um, they, they were a kind person. They weren't an evil person or anything like that. But we do that. We do. Religion does. Well, you know why you were not blessed is because you probably got some unconfessed sin, because there's probably something back there you forgot about. There's probably something hidden away. We do that all the time. We would do that. The, the sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh means um, forgetting, forgetting what's behind you. And Ephraim means double portion. God takes double portion first and forget the stuff last. Now, that ought to make you a little crazy right there, right? Uh, God says, no, 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 wait a minute. I'm going to bless you first. Jesus, or we know that God loves us. or right, We love God. Not because we loved him first, but because he first loved us. He first loved us. The blessing comes first. The forgetting what's behind comes last. After we're blessed, we can take care of all the other stuff. Now, I'm, I'm talking about all the blessing, because the word blessing here means the totality of blessing. This doesn't mean just financial wealth or, uh, you know, a check in the mail type of thing. This, um, or coronavirus check, it hits your, hits your uh, bank account, right? No, it doesn't mean that. 
This means the, the totality of blessing. You, you, you are blessed to first before you see any, anything. You're blessed. You're, you've got hands laid on you, and you're, you're told that you will be a blessing going in and coming out. You're in everything, yeah, in your peace, in your joy, in all the things of life. You're going to be a blessing, and you are blessed in them. And then God says, okay, now, now that you've seen how good I am to you, you can forget all that stuff that's behind you. It doesn't make any difference. I, I Look, I pulled you out of it. I gave you joy. All that stuff behind you, it's going to give you misery. I gave you joy. All the stuff you've been terrified from the past, I'm going to give you peace. All the poverty is behind you, I'm going to give you prosperity. All the sickness behind you, I'm going to give you, give you health. It's just how the Lord works. It's his MO. That's, and that's what I'm talking about with Joseph here. Genesis 49, 28. All these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. This is really significant for us. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 3, 8, and then 3, 11. Nancy says, without the blessing, we would be unable in our own strength to forget. Nancy, great point. Man, if, I wish I could attach stars to your name tonight. <laughs> That's a great point. Without that blessing, because the blessing, along with the blessing, comes strength. And, and the intestinal fortitude to, to be able to put, put whatever's back there, back there, keep it back there, right? And to walk away from it. That takes a lot of strength. Now, here's another point to all this. When, when um, Jacob blesses the 12 sons, he, he leaves Joseph out, but he brings in Manasseh and Esau. I mean, Manasseh, Manasseh and Ephraim. They're blessed too. So he brings them in and he blesses them, or pardon me, in this blessing, he, leaves, he brings Joseph in. Manasseh and Esau have already gotten the first blessing, which really speaks of us as believers. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 3, 8, and then 3, 11. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Verse 11, for no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Like Israel and his children, our joint foundation is all laid in one, but our labors are ours. We carry our own blessing in Christ. How I'm blessed is not the same as how you're blessed. What my, um, what my forte is in life is not your forte in life. What my gift is is not your gift. And the point with that J uh, Jacob makes with all of his 12 children, all of them are important. And he even says that. They're each blessed according to their own blessing. Each believer is blessed according to his own blessing. We're not blessed according to somebody else's blessing. Man, that should take a big load off your, off your mind right there, just to know that what somebody else got, if you don't, if you, uh, bad English here, if you don't got it, don't worry about it. It wasn't for you. You've got something else that's just as important coming your way. Whatever blessing God blesses with, he blesses everybody individually. But there is one foundation laid under it all, and that is Christ Jesus. He is the foundation laid under everybody, and on that foundation come the blessings. Individual blessings. All of the disciples, the, the 12 disciples, obviously Judas Iscariot bailed out, right? But then Paul comes in. And uh, when, you, when you look at those 12 people, the 11 plus Paul, all of them had very different ministries. And yet they all had powerful ministries. They all had ministries of martyrdom, except for John. 
and and there was hardly anything the same in any of their their abilities or what they were good at, even where they went to to preach the gospel. It was all different because we all carry our own deal. 1 Corinthians 12, 6 through 11. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Exactly like the brotherhood that was there in Israel. Each one had their own spot, their own blessing, but it was for the profit of all, for them, for them to be a great nation. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the works, working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. It is God who is the blesser. It's not us who go out and pull the blessing down from heaven or chase it down or pursue it or work our way into it or go out in, in a hunt for it, to find it and track it down and so that we can get the blessing that we want. It is God who wills and it is God who blesses us according to his will with all the spiritual blessing that we need for the course that our life is on. Ephesians 4, 7 through 8. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. We're all given the same spirit from the same source of grace. It is all according to Christ's measurement, not our measurement. However, he gives gifts according to his will, not ours. This is why we cannot judge each other in our works for the Lord. Where one person is at, somebody else doesn't have to be at. It's like people, well, you need to be a an evangelist like Billy Graham. There's not going to be an evangelist like Billy Graham. There will be other evangelists who will be them. They will be like them if they're really called of God and really given that gift. They will be exactly like them, not like Billy Graham. He was his own character. He There, there won't be anybody else like him. D.L. Moody was a great evangelist. Not like, not, I mean, he wasn't at all like, um, like Billy Graham, but he was a great evangelist. John G. Lake, great prophet, and, and uh, started the Apostolic Church of South Africa. And uh, countless, countless miracles done at his hands through the Lord Jesus Christ working through him. Is there going to be somebody else like him? There hasn't been yet. But then Oral Roberts was a healer. Not been anybody like Oral Roberts. I mean, just go through the people that we talk about, Catherine Kuhlman and all them. There's just not people like them. They, they have a different ministry. People used to make fun of Benny Hinn because he blew on people. Other people tried to blow on people. It didn't work. It's because it wasn't their thing. It, it just wasn't the way they were supposed to function and operate. But yet we all have the same spirit, the same blessing or same source of blessing, but it's our blessing. And it's not shortchanged. It's not a lesser blessing. It's the same blessing. Because it's the measurement of Christ's gift. Nobody's more important than anybody else. Each of Jacob's sons were blessed with their own blessing and direction in life. Genesis 50, 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps Joseph will hate us, and they actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, before that father died, he commanded, saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now, please forgive the trespass of the servants of, your, of the God of your father, when they said these words, Joseph wept when they spoke to him. He didn't weep because they had apologized. He weeped because they thought they had to apologize. 
after all the goodness he did for them, after all the blessing, after all the provision he made for them, they still thought the other shoe was going to drop. You know how many Christians I run into all the time that think the other shoe is going to drop? And, and they apologize to God continually for their life? We don't have to apologize to God continually for our life. He made us, he directed us, he gave us a path. It was our path. Look at how they answer that Joseph gives his brothers. Look at this. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. How many believers do that with the Lord? Lord, just make me a servant. I just want to be a servant. Okay, I understand this. you got to have a servant's heart. We understand that. Jesus had a servant's heart. But God isn't expecting you to be um, a, a mind-numb robot just waiting on every word that he says to go out. And, and if he doesn't say it, you're not going to do anything. God wants you to pick up and take the gift that he has for you and use it. Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for I, for him, I in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me. Listen to this. God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is one of the most reassuring passages, I think, in all of Scripture for, for people who, who just really need love to understand how big God is and how much he loves us, because this is exactly the heart of Jesus. They're still carrying their guilt and shame. His brothers are. Joseph's brothers are living in fear because of the wrong that they did. Joseph relieves them with just a word. It's the same thing Jesus did for us. He relieved us with just a word. When we thought we were goners, bad shape, he took care of us. People are still carrying their burdens. They're still carrying their wrongdoings. And they're always looking for that thing that, you know, that thing that's going to steal their blessing away or take their blessing away. Instead of just enjoying life as it happens, day after day after day. You see a lot of people doing that today, just living in fear. And Joseph does exactly what Jesus did. He released the captives. Because so many people are captive to their own shame and guilt. Listen, we don't have any idea why our lives or any other person's lives goes the way they, they do. We just, we just don't. What we do know is that whatever men mean for evil, God will bring about good from it. He will turn it around. You say, well, there's been some horrendous things happen in our nation, some horrendous things that I know people went through. This coronavirus thing, it's a, I mean, why are we going through this? God wasn't surprised by any of this. He knew this was going to happen. And he will turn this around to bless us. The church got hit by a tornado last Wednesday. And I could, I mean, I wasn't happy about the, the additional work and things I had to do with it. But I can tell you this, in the end, we will turn out blessed because of it. I don't know how yet. I just know it's going to be. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those, that, those who love God, to those called according to his purpose. In Romans 8, 26 and 27. Leading up to that verse, likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought. But the spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Listen, over and over in scriptures, we find men stumbling into blessing because they keep their hearts stayed on God. Even in our best times of prayers, we're weak in our understanding of what's coming up next. The next minute, the next hour, the next day, the next month. But we're always praying. You know, we're, we're always praying either to get rid of the past or we're praying for things to go a certain way in the future. Jesus tells us to live day by day, moment by moment. Why not allow the, the, the Spirit 
because that's what this is talking about, in prayer, the Spirit, who will, will pray in moanings and groanings that cannot be uttered, the Spirit will lead us in the direction of God, just like he did Joseph, just like he did David, just like he did Abraham and Isaac. The Spirit will lead us into the next step that we're supposed to take, because the, the steps of the righteous man are ordered by God, and that's us. Another good word, Nancy. Two stars tonight. The, she says, the more you understand the blessing, the more you understand your identity in Christ. Talk about having self-esteem or godly esteem. Yes, that's exactly right. Can you have God-given esteem or self-esteem? I'd rather have that God-given esteem. Which, by the way, doesn't make you like somebody that gets walked on every week. God-given esteem makes you bold like Joseph, yet humble enough to gain the favor of men. Amen. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Listen, have a great week. Have a great week. And uh, we will see you guys Sunday. We'll have another good service. And uh, be all right here online to, to really bless and be blessed. We love you guys. Have a great night. Blessings in Jesus' name.